name's Paul Lewin. I'm from the University of Southampton in the UK, and I'm the general chair of this, the 33rd Electrical Insulation Conference, which is also, and this gets a bit confusing, the 52nd conference in the now combined EIC and International Symposium on Electrical Insulation Series. Most notably, this is the first time that either of these conference series the, um, they've been chaired by someone who's not actually based in North America. And this has meant that uh, selection of the host city for this meeting was most, mostly gained by um, info information that I derived from the internet. Those of you that know me well realise that I have gained a certain level of harmony and inner peace from a technique known as the coffee beer balance. Um, in the mornings, I feel a very strong need for coffee, um, and I consume that as the day progresses, until the point where I'm worried that I might be awake all night due to the caffeine. And so then, to ensure that I sleep well, I start to consume beer. So, I googled Best Coffee City USA, Best Beer City USA, and here we are. <laughs> and to help you attain your own inner peace and harmony, in your delegate packs you will find lists of suitable establishments that allow you to practice attaining the coffee beer balance. The first EIC was in the late 1950s. There was actually a boom time for electric insulation. There was a huge worldwide investment in generation, transmission and distribution technologies. And over 1,300 delegates attended the very first EIC. In between times, interest in electric insulation may have waned. But it's now again a topic of increased worldwide interest. Not just in terms of our existing and ageing infrastructures, but also in the development of new technology in diverse areas from communications to robotic actuators through to future transport and energy storage solutions. Electrical insulation never has a greater role to play in our technical future. In organising this conference, our technical team uh, have tried to recognise this. Yesterday, we hosted the DEIS Smart Grid Technical Committee's workshop on the impact of smart grid technologies on plant health. And our technical session themes cover the latest developments in electrical insulation over a diverse range of subjects, from aerospace and transport through to new materials and the black art that is nanodielectrics. But before we start discussing where we are now and where we're going to go in the future, it's worth considering where we've come from. And I'm very pleased that Dr. Laurie Rux of the Programme Support Division of the US Army Corps of Engineers Northwest Division has agreed to give us a plenary lecture on the development of electrical generation, transmission and distribution in the northwest of the USA. So not wishing to delay any things any further, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Laurie Rux. It's really a pleasure to be here. I feel really honored to have been invited. I spent many years uh, sitting out there on that side of the podium, and um, it's, it's quite a privilege and a little daunting to be on this side. Um, but before I get started, I, I want to kind of politely point out to Paul that you can't always rely on what you find on the internet. <laughs> um, because really, the, the best city for Perfecting your coffee beer balance is probably Portland, not Seattle. <laughs> Next time. Okay. So, um, yeah, I want to talk about kind of the context of the business that a lot of you guys contribute to. And you're in a great location right now where we had, we had a lot of interesting um, firsts in here in the Northwest and some. Um, great technological achievements and some problems and um, 
and maybe a, hopefully a bright future. So I want to talk about that. So let's go to the next slide. So I'm starting my uh, talk here in the 1880s. The, actually, the population in this part of the country was pretty small at the time. Uh, but it was growing rapidly. The, the uh, Lewis and Clark expedition in the early 1800s kind of opened the, the path and the minds of people about, about the West. Um, but the Oregon Trail made a way for people in riding uh, trains to, to come across the, the Rockies and, and get here. And, and then the Continental Railroads um, also provided a way for settlers to come. And, and it really attracted people who were risk takers and strivers and entrepreneurs. And so, uh, you know, we like to think of ourselves as having that history and, and having people still who, um, who have that spirit today. But before we talk about the Northwest, I, I want to talk about a few things that were happening elsewhere in the country that were very, very foundational to, um, to, to the Northwest electricity industry. Um, probably a lot of you know about Charles Brush, who uh, uh, really perfected the DC generator, the dynamo, and also the arc lighting system. He was a tireless inventor uh, in, from Cleveland, and uh, really quite a visionary. He, had a, he grew up a few miles outside of Cleveland and had this idea that he could build a, a dynamo and he constructed the parts and he went to his family's farm and put it all together and used their um, horse-drawn treadmill, which was the only power source at the farm, to, um, to, to power the dynamo and his invention was successful and it turns out that his design was um, very elegant and easy to maintain and really considered to be the best way of powering arc lights. And he also worked on arc lights themselves. And if you don't know too much about arc lights, they're, the carbon arc lights, they have a, an electrode, uh, carbon electrodes that just operate in the air, and the, the, the uh, electrodes can be close together, and so a pretty small voltage can um, establish an arc between them, and then you pull those electrodes apart, and, and the arc vaporizes the carbon and creates quite a brilliant light. But the light itself, um, erodes the electrodes, and so the spacing of them changes as those electrodes wear, and uh, it caused problems with reliability and uh, and with the um, you know the maintaining um, consistency in the lighting, and so they had to go and manually adjust the space between the those electrodes. But uh, but Bush came up with a way to um, automatically using um, electromagnets. Um, to adjust the spacing, and it was really quite a, a, quite a clever design. And so, between his dynamo and his arc lighting system, he really produced something that was very practical for the for the public. And another uh, great inventor at the time, and this isn't his picture, but uh, is Tom Edison. And uh, even though Tom Edison didn't invent the light bulb, he did invent the first practical, long-lasting incandescent light. And uh, so in 1897, he did a demonstration at his research and uh, manufacturing facility at Menlo Park. And 3,000 people came to that demonstration. One of them was a gentleman called Henry Villiard, who was, at the time, president of the Oregon Railroad and Navigation Company. And that company was building a new steamship called the SS Columbia, Steamship Columbia. And this was the first steamship in the world that actually used um, electric lights instead of oil and gas lights. So when Henry Billiard saw the demonstration at Edison's uh, facility, he asked Edison, he personally asked him if he would put the lights onto the steamship that was being built. And Edison was kind of reluctant because he wasn't sure about the reliability of the marine environment. And he was also wanting to kind of focus on um, you know, central power systems and but anyway, he, he relented, and so the, um, the ship was built, and it was, uh, it, it was fixed up with the, the electric system. So there were four 100-volt dynamos installed in the engine room of the ship, and each one could supply 60 lamps of 16 candle power, and somebody probably knows the conversion better than me, but I think it's about, a 16 candle power is about a 25-watt light bulb. Um, 
So there are multiple circuits used on the system, on this on the boat, and they only lit the kind of the main salons and the and the um, staterooms. So on the, um, the system was pretty crude. The, uh, the the dynamos were controlled by an attendant, and the only there were no actual controls, uh, you know, automatic controls, and no instrumentation whatsoever. There was a pilot light, and the attendant would try to adjust it so that the pilot light in the engine room had about the right brightness. And the individuals didn't have the ability to operate the lights in their rooms themselves. They'd have to call an attendant, and the attendant would come and with a key, and he would unlock a little wood box outside the stateroom and switch the light on and off, and then lock the box up again. But even so, um, it was a pretty fantastic system, and during the trip from New York to actually San Francisco and then Portland, there were 400 and some hours of continuous operation of the lights and not a single one failed. And I think at the time, you know, the, the, there wasn't a Panama Canal, so they went all the way around the, the Cape Horn. It was a long, long path. So the, the ship arrived in Portland, first time electric lights had better, ever been put on a, on a vessel, and sailed up from Astoria to the Columbia River to the Willamette River into Portland, and lights were strung from the ship to a hotel in Portland and lit the lights of the Clarendon Hotel. And that was the first time, first demonstration in the whole Northwest of electric lights. And 2,000 people came, and the Oregonian newspaper said, the powerful rays lighted up the whole neighborhood to the brightness of day, and it was just spectacular. Hydropower in the Northwest is the obvious choice for powering generators. The first hydroelectric dam in the Northwest was built at Spokane Falls in Washington, now just called Spokane. It was in 1885. And an entrepreneur named George Fitch, he asked for and received a city franchise so that he could personally um, install lights and power the lights on downtown Spokane. So he purchased a 30 kilowatt dynamo. Um, interestingly, that dynamo came from Henry Villard's personal yacht, the Columbia, not the SS Columbia, but uh, it was disassembled from uh, Villard's personal yacht. And Fitch put it in the put the dynamo in the basement of a flour mill, and he powered it by the Spokane River. And a year later, Fitch. Uh, was able to sell his system to a group of local businessmen and investor-owned utility was starting, and, uh, and then the system was upgraded at that time. Another town in Oregon, uh, Oregon City, has the good fortune of having a significant water feature in its um, city limits. And it's Lana Falls. And Lana Falls is second only to Niagara Falls in terms of water volume. Uh, well, Lana Falls is a kind of a horseshoe shape. It's 1,500 feet wide, 40 feet high, and the flow is nearly 31,000 CFS. And in, uh, at the time, a Oregon City banker, Edward Easton, he was hearing about electrical service, and he knew that the people of Oregon City would like that and would be willing to pay for it, and he thought they might be willing to pay just about any price for that. So he decided that he would install a dynamo at the falls and um, sell power to the residents. So in 1888, he founded the Willamette Falls Electric Company, and he installed a dynamo at one of the sawmills at the falls. And Oregon City was an electrified town. But Eastman knew that he could really make some money if he could actually deliver electricity to Portland, which is 14 miles away and a much bigger city. So he and his partner, P.F. Morey, they constructed a dynamo house on the east bank of the Willamette River. They called it Station A, there in the picture, and awarded the contract to have a transmission line poles and wires strung along the bank from the station to Portland, Oregon. So on, at 10 p.m. on June 3rd, 1889, a, flip, a, a switch was flipped, and the new powerhouse um, had it delivered the electricity to Portland. Over 14 miles of wire, 
This was the first long distance transmission line in the world. 55 carbon arc street lamps were lit in downtown Portland. By June 10th, another dynamo was connected to Station A, and before the year was over, 11 DC current generators were drawing power from the falls and lighting the streets of Portland. And this was the first time in history the streets of a major city were bathed in grid-powered electric lights. So for a year or so, Portland relished in the, uh, the status of being you know, the first only city really in the U.S. with these uh, grid-powered lights, and then disaster struck. The Willamette Falls had a flood, and the powerhouse was flooded and the equipment was damaged. But the Willamette Falls Electric Company took advantage of the opportunity, and they rebuilt. And this time they rebuilt with Tesla's AC system, manufactured by Westinghouse. So they installed six single-phase, 125-cycle, 80-kilowatt dynamos, wound for 4,000 volts. And they powered Portland in 1880, 1890 rather, and again, Portland was the first city in the world to get AC power from a long-distance transmission line. Oh, and uh, to go back, sorry. So actually there's a, a park in Portland that uh, has a rock and a plaque that you can go and visit sometime and you'll see where the, the termination was for that transmission line. So cities and towns began to use electricity for street lights, pumping drinking water, operating street, uh, street cars. Uh, motors replaced difficult to maintain steam engines in factories. Interior lighting, fans, and work saving appliances like electric irons and washing machines and sewing machines were quickly introduced and electricity was very popular. So private and investor-owned utility companies quickly formed to meet the growing demand and to capitalize on the business opportunity. In 1884, Portland businessman George Weidler, an engineer, Parker F. Morey, formed the United States Electric Lighting and Power Company, which is the predecessor to Portland General Electric. And around the same time, a representative from the Brush Arc Company organized a competing utility company in Oregon called the Oregon Electric Company. And then a year later in Seattle, a representative of Edison General Electric Company organized the Seattle Electric Lighting Company. In, um, in, because in, in many, many cases, the system was just, the electric system was a single dynamo and short transmission line and, and lights, a lot of independent companies sprung up, at least so-called neighborhood electric companies. And in Seattle, in the 10 years between 1885 and 1895, there were nearly 30 electric companies, and many only had just like a small generator in the basement of a building. Public power is a very important business model in the Northwest. And it got, it, it got started in, uh, through municipal utility systems. McMinnville Power, okay, so in 1888, the town spoke of McMinnville realized that they needed an electric, um, well, what they needed was a um, safe drinking water system. Actually, at the time, uh, typhoid from individual wells was a, a very frequent problem. And so the city banned the use of those individual wells and instead pumped water from the Yamno River. So as long as you're going to pump water, you might as well use the electricity to generate, uh, to, to power lights. And so the city built a um, the McMinnville water and light plant and that went into service in 1889. The cost of pumping the water to your home was $1.50 a month. And the cost of lighting one 16 candle power lamp from dusk until 10 o'clock was one dollar and if you wanted to use it until 10 p.m. or after 10 p.m. rather uh, between 10 p.m. and midnight it was a dollar 25 a month 
and it was an additional 75 cents if you wanted to burn the light all night. So, other towns like Tacoma, Port Angeles, and Seattle, they also developed regional municipal electric systems shortly after McMinnville. And a big motivator for doing that was, part of it was price. You could cut out the profit-making utility, but also some of those profit-making utilities weren't really interested in um, sending lines to small towns where there weren't a lot of people to pay for the service. So in the early 1930s, Washington and Oregon passed laws allowing rural communities to actually join together and rather than just individual municipal utilities, they were able to form public utility districts and um, combine their, source, their sources that way. And so by 1940, 59% of the farms in Oregon had electricity, and in Washington, the figure was 71%. So as AC systems came into being, it enabled larger centralized generating stations to be built, and it was cost effective to transmit the power to remote locations. So this uh, really presented a business opportunity for entrepreneurs like Samuel Insull of Chicago Edison. He was able to exploit greater economies of scale uh, and maximize profits by consolidating smaller utility companies. In, uh, by 1907, Insull had acquired 20 utility companies, and he re renamed his firm Commonwealth Edison. <laughs> so before World War II, ut small utilities were led by engineers and, and technically trained people who provided those small companies with engineering expertise on how to develop power and transmit it and distribute it and, and how to use it for their customers. But after World War II, with this consolidation and centralization, what was really needed was capital to build larger systems. And so, rather than having engineers run the companies, there was a transition to having investment bankers run the companies. So, electric power barons like Ensel began to restructure their companies largely through the use of this holding company. And a holding company holds an interest in subsidiary companies and sometimes those subsidiary companies have interests in other subsidiary com companies and it ended up creating a kind of a pyramid and initially those small companies had their own in-house engineering staff but this notion of a holding company let the engineering be consolidated and, and you know you would hope efficiencies but actually what happened was those holding companies tacked on costs and for management and operational support that they really didn't provide, and it ended up weighing down those um, local companies and really driving up the rates. So there was also a lot of speculation in the investment community about those utility companies and really a lot of corruption. And um, by the end of the 1920s, Ten utility systems control three-fourths of the United States power business. And the speculation in utility stocks was a significant factor in the stock market crash of 1929 and the depression that followed. Theodore Roosevelt hated holding companies. He called them evil. In his State of the Union address, uh, he railed against them. He had a hard-fought presidential campaign and just as hard of a, a fight in opposition to those utility companies. But he prevailed and in 1935, Congress passed the Public Utility Holding Company Act. And that act outlawed that pyramid structure, structure of holding companies so that a company could not be more than twice removed from the operating subsidiary. And if the company operated across state lines, they had to register with the Security and Exchange Commission and provide detailed financial accounting. And if they operated within the state lines, there were state laws that provided the regulation necessary. So this law forced a divestiture and really is responsible for the, the paradigm that we 
are familiar with for electric companies, which was a kind of single vertically integrated system for a specific geographic area. Roosevelt ad advocated a strong federal role in the Pacific Northwest. You know, his uh, election in the midst of the Depression led to the authorization of some public works projects, including the construction of Bonneville and Grand Coulee Dams. Bonneville was built by the Corps of Engineers, and Grand Coulee was built by the Bureau of Reclamation. The Bonneville Project Act, signed in 1937, created Bonneville Power Administration. And the mission of the uh, of BPA was to encourage the use of electricity, giving preference to the federal systems output to publicly and cooperatively owned utilities, not to private utilities. So BPA first transmitted energy over its own transmission lines from Bonneville Dam to the, the nearby town of Cascade Locks. It uh, had a 230 kV transmission line from Portland to, from the dam to Portland uh, in 1939. It also at the time was building a transmission system from Grand Coulee to the uh, Portland area. And BPA now has over 15,000 miles of transmission line. So the first Bonneville Power Administration administrator was J.D. Ross, kind of an iconic figure in this area. He actually was um, president of Seattle City and Light for a time. So he was a strong public power advocate. And he established this concept of uniform um, rates called a postage stamp. So just like in a postage stamp, no matter where you live, the cost to deliver mail is the same. And his, uh, the, the BPA concept was no matter how rural you were, the cost to get power to you was going to be the same whether you live close or you live far away. So this really encouraged the development and the use of electricity out in the rural areas. He, um, Ross also encouraged the actual formation of PUDs in these rural areas, public utility districts. And he, uh, and he also sought industrial cu uh, customers to provide revenue. At the, at the outbreak of World War II, these new power plants, these new federal systems, really uh, supported the defense industry, particularly the uh, production of aluminum, as well as plutonium production at Hanford Reservation. So today, there are 14 dams on the main stem Columbia River, three of them in British Columbia and 11 in the US. Five of the dams in the mid-Columbia, the mid-sea as we call it, are non-federal dams because in the 1950s, uh, President Dwight Eisenhower kind of shifted the national policy from federal dam construction to one of encouraging the local communities to build dams on the rivers. The Columbia River Treaty, which is really on the minds of the Canadians, I think, more than the, the U.S. I think a lot of people don't even realize that we have a treaty with Canada uh, on, this, on this issue. But uh, it was ratified in 1964 after 20 years of negotiation. And it led to the construction of three storage dams, uh, the, the three storage dams in British Columbia. And those dams capture snow runoff and uh, for release later on in the year. It helps lessen the fluctuations. The, Col the Columbia was known to have you know, strong string pulses and um, much smaller flows in the winter. So this treaty doubled the water storage capability of the Columbia River, and the treaty is up for renewal now, and negotiations are underway, and it's, uh, it was complicated and difficult then, and because of environmental and tribal considerations, it's, uh, it's even more difficult now. But I think both parties have uh, acknowledged that there's a lot of value in that treaty. So the hydro system of the Columbia River provided fuel for the region's growth after World War II. But in the late 1960s, energy planners were predicting shortages by 1980. So at the time, 
you know, recently the nuclear reactors at the, Han uh, the Hanford Reservation in Central Washington kind of made electric utility companies think that nuclear energy was a, a viable option. And so there was a very ambitious plan called the Hydrothermal Power Plan, and the, the intent was for Bonneville and its customers to build 21,000 megawatts of thermal power and also an additional 20,000 megawatts of hydropower between 1971 and 1990 to supplement the federal hydropower system on the Columbia River. Phase one of that project was to construct two coal plants and five nuclear plants uh, that would be built over a period of 10 years at a cost of $1.7 billion. There was a cooperative agency comprised of public utility districts and municipal districts throughout Washington called the Washington Public Power Supply System, and they wanted to lead this public power nuclear development. So the supply system, also fondly called whoops, but the supply system, they sold bonds and to finance the construction project. The first three of those five nuclear plants received financial backing from Bonneville, but plants four and five depended on contracts with some participating utilities around the region who bought shares of the plants. These contracts had something called a hell or high water clause, which meant that the utilities had to pay for the cost of construction, whether or not the plants produced any energy. So five 1,000 megawatt nuclear plants uh, was a very ambitious project, especially for a small and pretty inexperienced agency like the supply system. And almost as soon as it got started, troubles arose. There were <coughs> schedule delays, cost overruns, mismanagement, all kinds of problems. And in order to cover the rising costs, Bonneville Power Administration had to raise its rates. It had only done that one time since its inception in 1938. But in 1974, Bonneville raised its rates 27%, strictly for, mainly just to cover the cost of this construction project. In 1979, they raised rates again by 90%. And then in 82, they raised rates again by 57%. So as you can imagine, as the public was hearing these announcements about the delays and the cost increases, support for these nuclear power plants waned. So by the 1980s, the total cost was projected to exceed $24 billion. So what had started off at looking like cheap electric nuclear energy turned out to be very expensive indeed. Those cost increases led to the cancellation of projects four and five. Those were the ones without Bonneville's financing. So that meant the member utilities were obligated to pay back the money that they had borrowed. And there was $2.25 billion of bonds and another $5 billion of interest. And the utilities, these small public utilities in Washington, would be ruined if they did that. And the public fumed over the project. So the utilities went to the, uh, went to the states to see if there was a way to get out of the pickle they were in. And in 1983, the Washington State Supreme Court ruled that the public utilities had lacked the authority to enter into those um, projects, the hell or high water projects. And so there was nothing left to do than default on the bonds. And the bondholders promptly sued. They sued the supply system, the utilities, and virtually everyone associated with the projects. They charged fraud and misrepresentation in the sale of the bonds. So on Christmas Eve in 1988, out of that $8 billion cost, $750 million settlement was reached. So that meant the investors received between 10 and 40%. 10 and 40 cents for each dollar invested. Plants one and three, which were backed by Bonneville, were also terminated in 1984. Ultimately, only plant number two was completed, and it's now called the Columbia Generating Station. So the cost of all those three plants, with only one producing energy, 
is borne by Bonneville Power Administration, and really the power that's produced by the Columbia River. In, in 1984, those whoops costs made up approximately 44% of Bonneville's power rates. Bonneville still carries $6 billion of debt for those three plants, and the debt service on those contributes approximately 19% of the total operating costs. And the debt will not be retired until and for another 30 years. So 60 years of debt and one power plant as a result. So Washington Public Power Supply Systems, they changed their name. They're now the Energy Northwest. But the legacy and really the burden of the costs still lingers and is uh, carried by the ratepayers in the Northwest. The predictions about the need for power uh, were very, very wrong in the 1970s. And it led to some bad investment decisions. And uh, so, legislatively, there was a new uh, a law enacted that created an organization called the Northwest Conservation Council. And it was um, created by Congress in 1980. And it involves the states of Idaho, Montana, Oregon, and Washington. And it, this group provides planning and policy leadership for the power system and for the fish and wildlife issues that result from the power system. So uh, the, the council prepares reports, not annually, but every uh, six years or so, and um, project power needs and plans for how to um, improve the habitat and the fish survival in the Columbia River. The act directs that Bonneville Power Administration will pay for this council, which it does, and for the program that it supports, which it does. And the Fish and Wildlife Recovery Program now is about $250 million per year. It's one of the largest national, uh, largest regional recovery programs in the nation. And that $250 million a year represents, like I would say, about 40% of the total cost of O&M and management of the entire system. So a lot of the money is going toward the Fish and Wildlife Program. So good things are happening. Good things have happened. The program calls for um, <coughs> ways to improve fish passage. When the power plants were built, there was a recognition that they were barriers to fish, and so uh, there were uh, adult ladders, fish ladders, that let the adults swim upstream up the fish ladders, and for the most part, the juvenile fish coming down came through the turbines and, and over spillways, and um, the fish survival of the juveniles in particular was not good, and when you compound that dam after dam after dam, and you take off a few percent, uh, it has a very, very big impact on the fish. So there's been a lot of great research done in developing bypass systems and uh, flow schemes and other, other mechanisms to improve the fish passage. So the river basin, the Columbia River Basin is known for hydropower, but actually there's another natural resource, wind, which is becoming a viable and significant addition to the electricity supply of the region. If you drive up the Columbia Gorge, you'll see hundreds of wind turbines connected to the transmission line and connected to the high voltage system. Uh, the hydropower with its flexibility and the wind with its variability, uh, they support each other. So the Northwest Planning Council has uh, called for up to 6,000 megawatts of new wind power over a 20, the 20 year period. And um, of course there will be costs of incorporating these into the system in terms of the high voltage transmission lines that are needed and also um, just integrating them um, in the cost recovery policies and, and so on. So this is a chart that shows the current distribution of power sources. About 54% is hydropower and 14% is wind. That will go up. Um, and then natural gas constitutes about 15% and some a little bit of nuclear and, and so on. This shows the historical energy production. You can see the kind of the teal color 
or the turquoise color shows the wind and, and over the years since about 2006 the contribution of wind has grown a lot um, hydropower fluctuates a little bit kind of depends on the amount of water available and we've actually been doing some efficiency improvements also um, there's some of the projects to increase the amount of production for the same amount of water So, just to wrap up, you know, the Columbia River is really uh, a very important source of what it, of the life, uh, the lifestyle and the, um, oops, right there. So, the, the Columbia River is an important source of what it is. Um, in the Northwest. And the availability of inexpensive, cost-based hydropower has supported strong economic growth and helped provide other beneficial uses of the Columbia River, such as irrigation, flood control, and navigation, which are things that I, I do in my, in my job, as well as power. The renewable and um, clean energy has created a a lot of benefits, but it also has come at a significant cost to wildlife resources of the West and also to the Native Americans who rely on the fish for their um, their culture and their sustenance and their and the other fish dependent communities as well. And uh, businesses and recreations have suffered because of the damming of the river. But there's a um, you know, the, there's a permanent linkage now, and it's an inseparable linkage now, that the power that's produced from the dams is used to support recovery efforts. And so without the power, there will be no recovery. And so for the future, um, neither fish and wildlife conservation or power development can happen without recognizing <coughs> that linkage. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay, we have, I think we have time for a, a few questions. Uh, so, question. Okay, I'm done. Can you, uh, can you, great. Of course. Can you state your uh, name and affiliation, please? for 
the O and M of the plants. I think the plants, the investment has been lacking, and so you know we're expending the infrastructure and necessarily improving fish passage, but I think a little bit more emphasis on good science for the fish program would be would be a good thing. And um, if the cost of recovery is so high and it drives down the, you know, the competitiveness of hydropower, then I think everybody suffers for that. You know, in terms of the public power versus private power, I, I think the history in the Northwest um, is such that we like public power. We, um, I, I just, I don't see any efforts, any viable um, way of privatizing the power. Thank you for those questions. Nancy? Thank you very much, Lori. I'm uh, Nancy Cross with Thermal Technologies. This is a really nice step back from getting into the minutia of technology and look at how it actually impacts us as a society and how the power industry works. So thank you very much for this. Um, one of my questions to you is, since we're going to embark soon on some technical sessions, what area do you think that some more research needs to be done to help either the infrastructure, the transmission, the distribution, energy um, generation area? Where do you think that we could most quickly do impact or where we need to spend some time that in 10 years will give us impact? What do you see from your perspective? Thank you. Well, my crystal ball says, um, actually I think energy conservation is really, really important. And I think we've learned that when we implement uh, you know, infrastructure um, projects, they end up costing a lot, they have a lot of impact. And so I think in the, using the resources we already have in the most efficient way is going to be really important. And I think there is room for innovation. Um, I think particularly with wind and with hydropower, the ability to um, store energy, uh, energy storage devices would be really important. So that's what I would offer. Thank <laughs> you.